if you are visiting or you are new here, I uh, just want to add my welcome. My name is Doug, and I have the privilege of leading the team uh, here at Parkhurst, and um, it's great to have you here with us this morning. You're joining us in the last week of a, of a series that we're doing on something, on something called Gospel Culture. Uh, this is week six, so if you've missed the other five weeks, <laughs> that took me a while, uh, you can find them online um, somewhere connected to the church, but we're looking at how, how the doctrine that we believe shapes the culture that we are and the, the feel of our, of our church uh, community. And I would encourage you that if you um, are a regular and you've missed those weeks, or if you're new and you want to find out a bit of, the kind of what our church is about, what we hold dear, what we what we're about and what we want to be about, go and find those, those talks and listen to them, or you can watch them even. Uh, it'd be uh, helpful for you to get a snapshot. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so as we close it out today, we're looking at, if you're a note taker, we're looking at the culture of prayer. Um, and this is, uh, as we've gone through the six weeks, I keep saying each week, like, this one is the most difficult, this one's probably the most important, uh, whatever, whatever. And that kind of loses its impetus and its weight if you say that about every week, doesn't it? Uh, but this one, uh, <laughs> this one's really important uh, because Christians, Christians struggle to pray. I, I've been a Christian. Somebody asked me the other day, how long have I been a Christian? And I had to, um, you know, if you know me, maths is not my strong point, but it's almost 30 years. Next year will be my 30th birthday as a Christian. Uh, so I've been a Christian for a while. Um, and... If there's been one thing that's been constant in my journey as a Christian, it's been that prayer has been a struggle. Um, You would think that after 30 years of walking with the Lord, you would may have made some progress. And I'd be able to say to you, like, follow me as I follow Christ. Gather around, pick up your pen and paper, and I'm about to dispense upon you wisdom from above from my prayer journey, my life as a prayer warrior, and the reality is that I have more questions now than when I started, and I've probably had more disappointments than successes, if you want, and it remains a struggle to pray consistently and in a life-giving way, well, if you want. But I have learned a lot about praying, and we're going to look at, not what I've learned, but we're going to look at some of what the Scripture teaches, but it's not just the Christian struggle to pray. Uh, everyone struggles to, to pray. Uh, people struggle to even underst- understand what the concept of prayer is. Talking to God or listening to God. What is it? Is it talking or listening or is it a bit of both? Is it quiet? What is it? How, uh, how and why and when do we talk to this God? And I, uh, a couple of years ago, came across an article by, uh, about a Romanian guy who got himself into all kinds of trouble. Back in 2007, a guy called Mircea Pavel, who was serving 20 years in prison for murder, he brought a lawsuit against God. This is obviously maybe he had time uh, in jail. And he, he sued God for fraud and betrayal of trust. That was the, the impetus of his lawsuit against God. These are the charges that he brought against God. The defend, that, that the defendant God who lives in the heavens and is represented in Romania by the Orthodox Church, uh, that's who he directed his case against. He said he accused God of fraud, betrayal of trust, corruption, and influence peddling. In the documents it says this. He says, at my christening, I made a deal with the defendant God aimed at freeing me from evil. But the latter has not respected that agreement until now, although he has received from me various assets and numerous prayers. The court threw out his uh, case, said that God's not subject to law and doesn't have an address. They they couldn't deliver the papers on God. And it seems like a frivolous thing, and you think like, uh, what is his name again? Mercia, Pavel, like brew. You You need some time in the sunlight all those years in jail, not helping you, and all the lawyers love that story, but accusing God of of fraud and a betrayal of trust. He said, of my christening, I made a deal with the defendant, and throughout the years, I've given God a lot. I've tithed, I've been faithful, I've served, 
given him a whole bunch of stuff, and I've, I've made numerous prayers. I've, I've called out to God a whole bunch of times, and he hasn't followed through on his end of the deal. He hasn't delivered. He hasn't held to his end of the bargain. All I've, I've done all of these things, and God has either kept silent or disappointed me or ignored me. Basically, that's his claim. And I would say that if you're a Christian and there hasn't been a time or a season where you have maybe wanted to join in on a class action lawsuit like this against God, you, ha- you haven't really either prayed or been a Christian long enough. Because prayer will disappoint you. Prayer will lead to disappointment in God. It will cause you to run headlong into all your errant theology. Do you know what I mean? Like all the, all the theology that you have that's wrong, uh, that God is this or God is that, that you are this, that the world works like that, because the reality will show itself that God is not at our beck and call, uh, that prayer is a mystery, and that there is so much to learn. But I wanted to just mention that, that if you have struggled in prayer, if you struggle now to pray, which I think I'm amongst friends, I think I'm probably speaking to everyone here, whether you're a believer in Jesus or not, um, Prayer is a struggle for people and can be radically disappointing. We've mentioned in the series that doctrine shapes our culture. All the way through, we've gone and said, well, what do we believe? This is the whole understanding of gospel culture, that it doesn't actually matter what you believe or what you say you believe. How you live your life and how we act and live and function as a church displays and maybe sometimes betrays what we actually believe. So we can say a whole bunch of stuff, but unless it actually translates into behavior, to culture, to a way of living, what we say is not actually what we believe. And it's maybe nowhere else more apparent than in the area of prayer, than in this area of prayer. Just think about some of the things that many of us would hold to uh, in terms of the doctrine category of prayer. What do we believe about prayer? Um, ah, we're not going to do this by show of hands. Just nod along on Sunday morning. Nod along if you agree with me doctrinally with some of these statements that God hears us when we pray. Okay, there's some people who are listening. God hear, that God answers your prayer. He doesn't just hear it like noted, thank you, uh, received, e- uh, email received, you know. Please never ever send me an email like that. I hate those things. Please notify me that you've received this. Like, you sent it. I got it. Anyway, sermons are helpful for me just to debrief and process my issues. It's cheaper than counseling. Um, I appreciate your patience with me. That God answers. That God, would you believe doctrinally that God is with us? God is with us. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Doctrinally, we would believe that God is is always with us if you're a believer. Would you believe doctrinally that prayer works? That prayer is effective? Would you believe doctrinally that prayer is partnership with God? Partnership with God. That in in some mysterious way, that God uses our prayers to accomplish His purposes. That there are some things that only happen... Because you pray for them to happen. That's partnership. They remain an unreality until we ask for them to happen. Jesus says what? You have not because you ask not. There are some things that will not happen because we do not pray. There are some things that happen specifically because we pray. There is a connection, there's a correlation, cause and effect in prayer, we believe this doctrinally. Do you believe doctrinally that prayer actually shapes the world that we live in? Significantly alters the course of human history through the prayers of the children of God. So if we believe all of those things doctrinally, why is there so little prayer? Why is there so little prayer in your life? And why is there so little prayer in our church and in the church of God? If we believe all of those things to be true, doctrinally, at a functional level, there is a massive gap 
between what we say we believe and how we actually live our lives. And let me say it out front that this is the easiest area in the world for a preacher to make everyone feel terrible. Close runner-up is evangelism, but I think prayer is the winner. You know, who did you share your faith with this week? Huh? Huh? Anyone? Anyone? Good. Feel bad. Fix it this week. You know, that's not how we roll here, and that's not how we roll with prayer either. My job this morning and my desire is not to say, be better, try harder, sort your nonsense out, get on your knees, you know, change your ways, you useless lot. Like, that's not going to help. It's not going to help, but we do need to we do need to fix that gap between what we say we believe because we're not in and say, yeah, we believe all of these things. Prayer is effective. Prayer is the presence of God. Prayer changes the world. Prayer is God answering, God listening, God with us. And yet you look at your life and it doesn't, if it's anything like mine, it doesn't bear the witness, the testimony to the strength of those convictions. So my prayer this morning is that we try and close that gap. I have Six Ps, which is very unlike me, if you're hanging around here. Six Ps. I didn't even find these on the internet. These actually came to my head on my own. I'm becoming a Baptist. I don't know what's happening to me. Pray for me. I have six Ps that relate to prayer. I need your prayers. This cannot be a normal thing that's happening to me. Six Ps. Prayer as privilege. Prayer is privilege. I wonder how many of us live in that world and realize that prayer is a privilege before it's a duty and a responsibility. For the longest time uh, in my early walk as a Christian, that was my world that I lived in. Read your Bible and pray every day and you'll grow, grow, grow. Pray. You have to pray. It's good for you. It's like kale. You won't enjoy it, but it's going to help. You know, just... Just get it done. Um, get it done. It, it, it's not going to be fun. There's no joy in it, really, or there's limited joy, but it's essential. You just need to pray. It's duty, not delight as much. And I think as I've matured and walked with the Lord, I've leaned more into this, that prayer is actually a privilege. Prayer is primarily a privilege. Think with me who we're talking to, Psalm 113. We're going to be kind of all over the Bible. That's why I didn't ask you to open a specific scripture. In the coming weeks, we'll get back to our old ways of working through scriptures. But today, we're going to be all over the place. Psalm 113, from 4 to 6, the Lord is exalted above all the nations. His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one enthroned on high who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. Again and again, not just in the Psalms, but all the way through the Scriptures, God is at pains to make Himself appear in the reality that He's not like us. He stoops down to look on both the heavens and the earth. Turn it around. Gaze up into the heavens. Gaze up into the heavens that just keep going and going and going and going and the Bible says that God stoops down to look down on the heavens that we haven't yet found the outer parts of. When you think about who you're talking to, it changes everything when it comes to prayer. You're not talking to the ceiling or the walls or yourself. I think that's probably the most dangerous category. To be. But sometimes it can feel like that when you're praying. It's just like, who am I talking to? It's important to start with the word and remind ourselves, who are we talking to? It is a privilege for us that God has opened up a way for us to communicate with Him. The one who is enthroned on high and who stoops down to look at the heavens and the earth. That God would make prayer a possibility when He is quite so glorious should just cause your whole brain to just seize and melt. You're not talking to your buddy, your family member, your long-lost pal, someone around the world, the marvels of the internet, WhatsApp calls, those are all cool, amazing, look at what we've made. As, uh, you're talking to the one who's enthroned above the heavens. There is a privilege in prayer that we can't really wrap our heads around. 
part of that privilege is access. Is access. You don't have to make an appointment with God. Think of the most important person you know. The more important people are normally, the, more, the harder it is to see them. You have to make an appointment. You can't just wander in there. Uh, they protect themselves. They have people who protect them. Not so with God. Not so with our Father. There is 24-7 access. If you want to pray now, what do you have to do? Pray. If you want to pray at 11 at night, you can pray. You wake up at 3 in the morning, you don't have to make an appointment with God. You, know, you may need to wake up a little bit, but you can just pray. That we have access that is a privilege. The last thing on this is that we, we have a friendship with God. I want to commend to you, I'm always keen on you reading more good books. There's a book, and Dave will remember the name of the author. This, the, he mentioned it a couple weeks ago because we're reading it together. It's called Friendship with God. It's not a long book. It's a thin book for the non-readers. It is one of the most helpful books you will read. It totally has reframed my thinking of how I relate to God, that I have a friendship with God. And how I develop that friendship and respond to him as a friend of God's. That is a privilege that I was once an enemy of God's and now I'm his friend. And all of the benefits of the deepest and best friendship have come to me. Prayer is the way we express, the easiest way we express our friendship with God. Prayer, first, number one, first thing is prayer is a privilege. It's not as much a duty, it's more a privilege. The second P is that prayer is a priority. Prayer is a priority. You may or may not know the story of George Mueller. George Mueller was a, a famous pastor. He ran orphanages, Bible schools, preached up a ton, and was known for trusting the Lord in outlandish ways for his provision for uh, orphanages and stuff like that. Never asked people, always asked the Lord. And it's worth finding his a biography and books about him and reading it, it will help you. But in addition to that, there's a lot of stuff that he has written himself about his own journey with his devotional life. And he is famous for uh, this one conclusion that he came to. Listen to this. He says, I don't know if it's on the screen. Oh, it is here. The point is this. This is his kind of conclusion that he got to. I saw more clearly than ever that the first and, gr and, and primary business to which I ought to attend every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. To have my soul happy in the Lord. I want to provoke you and encourage you that the most important thing that you can do on a daily basis is to make sure that your soul is happy in God. There are, we live in Joburg. We're busy people. There's always extra things to do. We're running around, you know. We basically keep South Africa going. Um, all the Cape Tonians is just, doing their thing there. But we're, we're the engine room of the whole country, and you can feel the pressure to, like, make everything happen here. You know, Joburg is intense, fast-paced. Life is just like that. I wonder how often that phrase has washed over the shores of your life. Is your soul happy in God? Is your soul happy in God? George Mueller had thousands of kids who depended on him and on his ministry and stuff. He had a schedule that puts most of our schedules in the shade. And this is what he did. Every morning he would get up and say, this is my number one job today. Not to be busy for God. Not to do all these things. Not to be responsible to all these people. My number one responsibility and privilege every morning is to make sure that the soul of George Mueller is happy in God. My encouragement to you is this. Do whatever it takes to make sure that your soul is happy in God. That you, on a daily basis, are leaning into your relationship and your friendship with God so that if somebody comes to you and says, how are you? You say, my soul is happy in God. Yes, around me there may be chaos. Work, family, kids, finances, health, the country, all of those things. But how is it with you? Is it well with your soul? Is your soul happy in God? And everyone has different things that cause their souls to be happy in God. The point I mentioned of that is that prayer is a priority. It's a priority. It's not like, oh, I've got a bit of time left in the day. Let me 
mumble off a few prayers. And I've had many seasons like that. Um, a couple of nights ago, I had a really, really long day. My whole schedule had gone sideways, and the only time I got to pray was when I lay down at night. And I started praying, and it's happened to me so many times. I woke up in the morning, and I was like, I can't remember how far I got. And I think I got like, hey, Father, it's been such a long day. <laughs> like, I, I think the Lord was like, hey, Doug. Oh, okay, he's, uh, that's it. <laughs> Let's try again tomorrow. You know? That's happened to me so many times. Um, and I'm more, all I'm going to say is that if that's your pattern, that you pray at the end of the day, head on your pillow, and it's kind of interrupted conversations all the time, it's okay, but it's not a priority. And it's not going to feed your soul. You're not going to have a soul that's happy in God. Prayer is not something that we fit in once we've done everything else. Prayer is the thing that allows everything else to find its right place because it's our priority. As George Miller spoke in this devotional thing about his growth in prayer, um, he's got some stuff that's super helpful. That's why you should go and find it and read it. And he says that he used to just come to God and start praying. And his mind would wander and be all over the place. And he'd find himself 10 minutes in, half an hour in, an hour, an hour and a half sometimes, he said, before he actually started praying. Because his mind was just all with the fairies and ADD all over the job. Does that sound like anyone you know? Yeah, yeah, it sounds like you. It sounds like me. He says, you know what helped him was word-based responsiveness in prayer. That's how I've phrased it. Word-based responsiveness to God. So he started with the word. He said he came to God in prayer, but he started with the word. He didn't come to God and pray, 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 get his soul kind of warmed up, you know, do a bit of stretching. Prayer is like the exercise and then turn to the word. He said he turned to the word. He said, Lord, speak and reveal, show me who you are, and then I'm going to respond to you in prayer. And he changed the order around and he said he would, he would look in the word, then he would meditate, then he would, he would think about it, then he would pray. And that sped up the effectiveness of his prayers and his sense of his awareness of the presence of God. I wonder if you've tried that, and I would encourage you to start, make prayer a word-based response to God, not, not just sitting there thinking your, with your own thoughts. Prayer is priority. Let's keep going. Prayer is praise. Prayer is praise. If you look in the book of Psalms, you'll see again and again that that the main diet of prayer is actually praise. The main diet of prayer for modern Christians is petition, is asking, hey, God, I need help with X, Y, and Z, 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 this thing, my kids, my boss, my car, yada, yada, yada. Hey, signing off, I'm out of here, leaving that all with you. Next day, you know, we may be persevering in those things, but prayer is praise is what you see modeled mainly in the Psalms. An outpouring of worship, acknowledging and beginning with who God is and what He's done. That's what the Psalms all talk about. This is who you are, and this is what you've done, both in history and in my life, and what we're looking for you to do in the future. And the prayers are centered around that, not just this transactional thing, God, I really need help uh, with all of these things. This may sound like a strong statement, but I think there's very little that distinguishes the prayer of pagans to the prayer of Christians when the only diet is what we can get from God. Non-Christians pray. They do. But they pray out of panic. They pray out of panic. Something happens, panic sets in, they're going to try prayer. Panic disappears, prayer is gone. And if that is the rhythm of our prayer lives, we're not worshiping God in prayer. We're not resting in prayer. We're just, God is just the genie in the sky who runs to our rescue whenever there's a problem. And nothing separates our prayers from the prayers of godless people who don't actually know Him. Because prayer is a relationship that continues. Prayer is not a transactional thing where we're trying to wrest things out of God's hands. And you see in the Psalms, which is our prayer book for Christians in the Scriptures, that prayer is about thanksgiving and gratitude. And I want to encourage you to change the format of your praying and your diet. Leave the petitions. Actively force yourself to leave the petitions to the very end and begin with, you know, there's many different acronyms and prayer hacks and helps, but that ACTS one isn't wrong. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Start with just adoring God. Confess your sin. 
just thank Him for every blessing and goodness that He's given you in Christ, what He's doing in your life. And if you have time, get around to what you need or what you're longing for Him to do. Change the format, change the diet, and see what it does in you. See, see how difficult that is. It comes with a warning. That is hard. It's a struggle. You will find yourself, hey, God, um, be front-loading that. Be very quick. Hey, thanks, God. You're in charge. Amazing. Hey, I confess I'm a sinner. Thanks for your grace. Hey, you've been faithful. And then the long list comes again. We are so list and petition heavy in our prayers. We have to fight against that diet because the Psalms show us a different picture of what the relationship with God is really all about. When we, again, when we understand who we're talking to and with, it changes everything. And Jesus says what? When you pray, don't come to God with long lists and endless words and babbling like the pagans do. Why? Because your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. You don't have to wear God down with long lists and say, God, hey, by the way, this, this, this. He knows. He knows. We're not informing God in prayer. I hope you, understand. I hope you know that. It's not like a, if we don't mention it, like God's like, oh, whoa, oh, guys, somebody get onto that. That's completely off my radar. That doesn't happen with God. There's no informing Him. So we can go light on those things. That's why Jesus says, don't weary God with all of your words, especially if you're praying in public. You're doing that just to be heard by others, and there's emptiness in that. Trust Him that He knows everything. Make the diet of your prayer a deeply relational, worshipful, thanksgiving, gratitude-based relationship of both speaking and listening, it will change the way you pray. We don't have time to do more on that one. Let's do the next one. Prayer is petition. Prayer is also petition. Prayer is also petition. In Philippians 4, verse 6, Paul teaches the Philippians, he says, don't worry about anything. NIV, I think, says, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And, and, and what's going to happen? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ. I want you to see something there that you may not have seen. He says, okay, don't be anxious, don't worry. Come and in a spirit of thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Present your requests and your petitions to God then what's going to happen? God is going to answer all of your needs and your requests, and He's going to do everything you ask Him to do. Oh, wait, no. It doesn't say that. It says the peace of God, which goes above your understanding, was, is going to do what? It's going to come and form a God around your heart and your mind in Christ. It's going to build a wall around your anxious heart so that anxiety can't get in, and you are guarded in relationship and in the security of Christ because your circumstances may not change. There's no assurance given there that if you mention it to God, He's got it, and He'll sort it out. He'll sort that out, that pesky boss, or fix those finances, or heal that person, or do whatever. There's no promise in that. The promise is this, that you will experience a peace that goes beyond what you're able to understand. And you, it goes beyond what you're able to understand because your circumstances may not change. But this is the distinction for Christians, that we mention our requests to God. And regardless of whether He answers yes or no or resolves them, we are the people who stand in peace. Prayer is meant to move you to a place of peace, even if your circumstances don't change. That is the privilege and the miracle of prayer, that you are like a rock. You're standing on the rock. You're steadfast. God has encamped around you and your heart and your mind with His peace. There is nothing that touches that, guys. And, and just to add into the mix here, you don't want God saying yes to everything you ask Him. You're not wise enough. We're not sharp enough to know what we need. If I said yes to everything my 10-year-old asked me, he would be dead already. Four years ago, probably. You know, he, he doesn't have the wisdom to know what he needs because he's a kid. And you and I are children of God. And you don't know what you best need. And so when God says no or wait, it's 
because he loves you, not because he's mean. He is the best father. He does it all out of his abundant love and goodness for us. Our petitions partner with God in, in, in his purposes. Robert Law said, prayer is a mighty instrument, not for getting man's will done in heaven, but for getting God's will done on earth. We're not trying to convince God, say, God, we've got a better idea. How's about this? Prayer is a mighty instrument for getting God's will done on earth. That's what Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Not would my kingdom come in heaven as it is, I'm currently engineering it on earth. No, no, no. Lord, would your kingdom break out in Parkhurst as in heaven? Would it be in Parkhurst as in heaven? That's a thing to pray, isn't it? That's what Jesus is praying. He just didn't put a geography on it. Imagine your prayers were shaped like that. Hey, wherever you live, would it be in Blegari, in London, in Parkhurst? Would it be like here as in heaven? Would heaven come and invade earth? I don't want to get all weird and kooky, Pentecostal, Bethany. Some of those likes lose their way a little bit with that stuff. But there is an invitation from God for heaven the kingdom of heaven to find expression and authority on the earth. That's why Jesus encourages us to pray like that. Second last one, prayer is presence. I've had so many people, Christians, tell me over the years, I never really experienced God's presence. I never experienced God's presence. And to that I would just simply say, most Christians I know never sit still long enough or quiet enough to experience the presence of God. Your phone works against it. Your busy schedule works against it. Our other loves and distractions all work against us experiencing and enjoying the presence of God. The fault lies with us, not with God. He said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I'm giving you my spirit for these things. The fault lies on our end. It's a user error. We don't sit quietly or long, long enough to enjoy the presence and the power and the reality of God with us. And prayer is one way to help us with our awareness of God. If that would be a, something that you would say, I never really, well, I don't often experience the presence of God. The first thing as a pastor that I would say is tell me about your prayer life. Tell me how frequent it is. Tell me what it looks like. And I can die, I almost without fail, probably diagnose for you because I can diagnose it for myself. That is where the fault lies. It's that we don't have because we don't desire and we don't ask and we don't wait on him. Prayer is presence. It's been a while since I had a baby in the house. I mean, you all know I love babies. And one of the things I loved about early parenthood was when your kids fell asleep in your arms. I tried this with Jono the other day, but it didn't really work. Uh, <laughs> Ten-year-olds don't like being cuddled like that. He like, looked at me and he's like, what are you doing? You know, and then you wriggle out and punch me. Um, so parents treasure it while they will, even if you get a dead arm, soak up those years. But I remember those days like they were yesterday. And I remember a strange thing happening in me as a parent. That I loved them when they were, were awake and doing cute things and stuff. But there was a different kind of love that I had for them when they were lying in my arms doing absolutely nothing. They weren't contributing to our family they, well, they're still a bit behind on that one. Um, they weren't contributing to our family. They weren't smiling. They weren't doing anything. They weren't being productive, useful, enjoyable, any of that. They were just asleep. And I found love for them just pouring out of me, just in this inactivity because of there's a relationship there. This, you're my daughter. You're my son. I love you. Just at peace and at rest. He's like, I'm so comfortable with you, Dad. I'm just gone. And there's a sense in which prayer is like that. That you're just at rest with God. You're not trying to impress Him. You're not like just busy all the time. You're not mouthing off the whole time. You're just quiet with God. Because you know that your Father loves you and you don't have to impress Him. I hope you know that you're not impressive ever to God. He's not impressed with you. Through all the activity or you getting to church on time. or in, he, God, God is never impressed with you. He's only ever been impressed with his son. And we get united together with Jesus and therefore he's impressed with you. And nothing will ever change that. And so you just get to rest in the fact that 
God doesn't require activity of you. He's your father. And sometimes his love for you is the most profound when you're just resting in his presence, not trying to prove, not trying to clock up mileage, not doing anything else. He takes great delight just in your resting, in your identity with him. The last thing is that this prayer is perseverance. We read in Luke 18, Jesus teaching the parable of the persistent widow. And he says to them, now, it says in Luke 18 verse 1, he says, Now he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. And I'm not going to read the parable, you can go and read it. But I wanted to read that introductory line because it's important. We always rush to the parable. Why did he tell them the parable? He told them the parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. Why? Because well, there would have been an inclination to not pray always and to maybe give up. Jesus knew. Hey Amen. Prayer, prayer is going to require perseverance at times. You see again and again in the scriptures asking, seeking, knocking. God, the parable of the persistent widow is there to encourage you that God is not frustrated with your knocking. He's not frustrated with multiple asking. He encourages it. He delights it. Yes, he knows what you need. We already said that. But somehow in the mystery of the relationship and the tenderness of God as our Father, he still wants to hear us knocking on the door and hammering away. And some prayers will only come to fruition through persistence, through persevering prayer. Some of you know this. Some of you know that some of you have prayed for children, some of you have prayed for a spouse, some of you have prayed for finances, some of you have prayed for health, some of you have prayed for salvation for people, and you know that it took ages. I, I, I remember years ago leading a guy to faith in Jesus uh, who was, he was just 69, he was almost 70, and, and, and it, was, it was obviously a long road, and as he broke down, as he accepted Christ, um, he had an old Bible, and, and in it was prayers prayed, written from his parents that they prayed. And he knew that they'd been praying for him for decades. And he had just resisted coming to faith. And it was an overwhelming thing for him. He realized he, those parents never got to see the fruition of their prayers. They never got to see the result of the perseverance of their prayers until their 69-year-old son bowed his knee and became a believer in Jesus. Guys, sometimes it takes a while. God is not a vending machine in the sky. That's why Jesus says, I'm giving you this parable of the persistent widow because you're going to be tempted to give up. You're going to be tempted to give up and not to pray always. So here's a parable that God loves it when you knock on the door. And again and again. And at three in the morning when it's inconvenient, God is never inconvenienced. He loves that in his children. What does a culture of prayer look like in Parkhurst? It looks like an individual commitment, a recommitment to praying, and it looks like a corporate commitment to praying together. But I'm, I'm going light on this section because I don't want us just to develop an action plan and get the whiteboard up here and change our calendar and say, guys, we're adding more prayer meetings in. That's what we're going to do to make prayer part of our culture. We're just going to darise more prayer, and we're going to send out more prayer requests to you unless your doctrine is reshaped, and you re-believe, you re-believe the privilege, the priority, the power, the presence, the petitions, all those things we've spoken about, about prayer, unless you re-believe those things, they don't change the activity. And I want to encourage you to start and re-examine those things, how much you hold them to be true, and allow them to shape the, the way that you live, that prayer is this immense privilege for us individually, and it will then shape who we are corporately. And we will become, by God's grace, more of a praying church. And I'd honestly believe, I mentioned that this is the most important one, I honestly believe that if we would take steps in that direction, we don't pray so that God will just do outlandish things. We do, we pray to enjoy God and develop friendship with Him. But there is a correlation all the way through church history that when God's people get serious about Him and about praying, God breathes on those places and those people and those churches and does the most incredible things. So if you want to see God do the most astounding things in your life, through our church, in Parkhurst, in your work, in your family, whatever, there are things that are waiting to happen because they haven't been prayed about yet. 
prayer moves the hand and the heart of God like nothing else. So, let's pray. Father, you have, um, you have opened up a way for us to know you as our Father through Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that again this morning, Father. We thank you that because you, because you sent Jesus, Jesus, because you came, we may now know God as our Father. God, Father, you're not a concept to us. You're not a list of obligations and rules. You're not the author just of a book. You are the living God, and you are our loving Father. And because we've placed faith in you, we, we can know you. We can experience you. We can know without a... We can enjoy friendship with God. Not a long-distance friendship. The closest friendship that we'll ever experience. We thank you that all of this is the gift of the Spirit amongst us. Yeah, and Father, we, we simply want to ask this morning that for ourselves individually, you would re-teach us about the privilege of prayer, reorientate our beliefs about what this gift is that you've given to us of praying, and give us renewed commitment, desire, and love to be with you, to speak, to listen, to be quiet, to have our hearts made happy in you, to have our lives and our souls just changed and shaped by being a prayerful people. And that as we do that individually, you would, you would change us as a church, that you would see us as a praying people, that we would have the joy and the adventure yeah, and, and the joy, just the glorious joy of being a church that prays and sees what you will do in response to our being with you and our asking of you. Uh, all of these things are so counter our normal uh, pride and independence and self-sufficiency. And so we again look to you, Father, for the miraculous work of your Spirit to overcome that in us and do in us what you want to do to make us a more prayerful people and a more prayerful church, that we would be people who just deeply enjoy you and are deeply effective for the kingdom of God, both here and to the ends of the earth. And so we ask for your help. Would you breathe on us and help us through the Holy Spirit? Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.